Today's episode of Socially Democratic is presented to you by Dunn Street. Dunn Street partners with businesses, organisations, unions and social democratic parties across the globe to develop community organising strategies and train leaders to build power from within their community. And in 2021, Dunn Street will continue to work with folks that want to share their stories, inspire others, take action, give hope and organise communities for change. To find out how you can partner with Dunn Street, hit us up at dunnstreet.com.au. Socially Democratic is also presented to you by Morris Blackburn Lawyers. Would you like to work in sunny Queensland and grow your leadership capability? Morris Blackburn, Australia's leading class action plaintiff law firm, is looking for an experienced office leader specialising in personal injuries law. This is a fantastic and varied role in regional Queensland, giving you the ability to mentor, coach and build your team to be the best that they can be. Support for the relocation will also be provided. To find out more and apply, simply go to morrisblackburn.com.au forward slash careers. Be part of Change and Fight for Fair. Apply now. Hello and welcome to another episode of Socially Democratic, your weekly centre-left politics and organising podcast that dives into the progressive campaigns and issues of the day and the people leading them from home and abroad. And on today's episode, we are joined by the former federal Labor member for the seat of Adelaide and a former minister in the Rudd and Gillard uh, governments and now an author of a uh, an, her first book, Sex, Lies and Question Time. Kate Ellis is going to come on the show today to talk about that book um, and the, um, the whole uh, issue of toxic culture and how women struggle in Australia's parliament um, and the impact that it has both on her career and uh, 16 other women that she interviewed for this book. So it's a fascinating book and uh, if you haven't had a chance to um, read it, you should go to your local bookshop and, uh, and get your hands on it. So we've got Kate on today to talk about that book without giving you know too much away f- from um, the book itself because you should read it. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcast. Spotify, Amazon and Stitcher and if you're an Apple podcast user please give us a rating and leave a review and for all the most recent updates for the podcast follow Dunn Street on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn and Facebook. Okay let's get to today's oh wait before we go the other thing good luck to the Scottish Labor Party good luck to the Scottish Labor Party Um, as we record this right now it is election day in Caledonia um, Scots are going to the polls and we wish all of our friends in the Labour Party in Scotland uh, all our very best uh, and we're going to have uh, a special guest on next week to uh, unpack the results, hopefully a great result um, uh, for Labour. Okay, yes, now let's get to today's episode. We're taping this one on a Thursday afternoon, a lovely autumn day here. The sun is shining through the Dunn Street offices and uh, today's uh, guest is the former representative for the Division of Adelaide in the Australian House of Representatives for the Australian Labor Party from 2004 to 2019 and was also a minister in both the Rudd, Gillard and Rudd Labor governments And this year she has published her first book titled My Year of Silence While I Was Kept Back in the First Grade. Kate Ellis, welcome to Socially Democratic. Oh, thank you very much for having me. Nothing? (laughs) No, you've written a book called Sex, Lies and Question Time. That's very good of you to not bite on that. Impressive. Yes, I I am... um... Yeah, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say about that. Sorry, I'm not biting on that. I'm I'm focused. Uh, no, no. What it feels like to, if, uh, that was like a kind of a Zach Jalafanakis between two ferns kind of yes. moment, and I'm not going to keep doing that. <laughs> now, you and I spoke on another podcast. Uh, I have to go check the date. It was July 2017. Uh, you were about to finish up. Your career as a politician or had? Um, no, I'd announced that I was leaving. I was about to give birth. I was really about to pop. Um, but I still had another 
almost two years in the parliament. Right. So I, I wasn't intending on doing the questions about sort of backstory and, and, and yeah. the like, uh, only because we've sort of, we've covered that. But then I realised not everyone listened to that episode. And also... Outrageous. I know. Uh, and also there are many people who listen to this particular podcast that do not live in Australia uh, and may not know who you are. So maybe we'll do a little bit of backstory on okay. how it was that you came to become a politician in Australia's national parliament go um well in 2004 i had the opportunity to run for the seat of adelaide which was at that time and for the decade beforehand held by the um, conservatives and i was a um, keen 26 year old who thought i will give this one a crack and stuck my hand up and what do you know come election night i learned the news that um whilst my beloved labor party had been you know decimated across the country had had a terrible terrible election um that was when we had mark latham as our leader that we had managed to pick up the seat of adelaide and that i was now officially a member of parliament at the age of 26, why did you think uh, that this was something you wanted to have a crack at? I just, um, I believe then, as I believe now, that the greatest way you can bring about change is through the national parliament. There's no other way that you can deliver more for a greater number of people than the national parliament. And I mean, I think back then it was probably more so I really believe we need a change of government. I wanted um, an end to the Howard years and I wanted a government that more closely aligned with my values. And I thought that the best way we could do that is if we won more seats. And I knew that I'd work really hard in the seat of Adelaide to try and win it. So I thought I'd stick my hand up, try and do my bit to deliver a Labor government. And um, that was probably my motivation back then. And then you had a, a pretty successful career as both uh, a local representative in a, in the seat of Adelaide, which you know was a pretty tight marginal seat uh, when you took it off the Tories, and then turned it into a reasonably safe seat for Labor by South Australian standards. Anyway, what was I can't remember, think of it the highest margin you got it to. I think it was about nine percent. Mm. Although a really cruel thing happened. Um, I know I'm cutting ahead a little bit, but after I announced that. I wasn't going to run again. There was a big redistribution of borders um, and electoral boundaries in South Australia. And um, the seat of Adelaide is now, and I predict will probably long be a very safe seat as a result of the new boundaries. So um, it never was, I was always a marginal seat member, but Adelaide is a pretty good Labor seat now. So you had a, as a successful career, both as a representative, but also as a member of um, the senior Labor team in, in government and in opposition. Looking back on that career now, how do you reflect on that? You've had a bit of time to, you know, time and distance between today and when you first um, hung up your boots. What, is, what are your reflections on that experience? Oh, well, I, um, I just think there's no greater privilege. Um, you know, that was the most remarkable experience to get a chance to, you know, in my case, um, really bring about massive changes to the way we deliver and fund and the quality of early childhood education, which is a really big passion of mine. Um, that's an amazing experience. Uh, just yesterday, um, I was speaking at a corporate event and one of the questions someone asked me is, do you think you can bring about more change within the parliament or now that you're outside the parliament and you're free to jump up and down as much as you like? And I said, there's just no question about that. Like um, being not just in the parliament, but having the chance to put your case around the cabinet table is how you change Australia and improve Australia. And um, I just reflect that I'm so lucky to have that privilege and I will always value that. Can you think of uh, a moment that defines that? Um, one moment that defines that? Oh, you're asking some hard questions already. Um, Oh, well, one of them was when I later went to um, enrol my firstborn in um, the local childcare centre 
And I got there and his educator sat me down and was telling me how it all worked. And she said, now I need to tell you there's these new things called national quality standards. And what that means is that this is how many educators we'll have for each child. And then she was going on and telling me about um, the early years learning framework um, and how that's what they base all their, their teaching around. And, you know, that was the first curriculum we had for early childhood. And of course, I was the minister that got to oversee both of those reforms. So I was acutely aware of them. But I did have this moment where I thought, this is amazing. It's not just amazing for my beautiful Sam, but it's amazing that every parent of every child across Australia would then get that same talk um, and would know that there was a greater standard of care and supervision and education that their child was going to get. And it kind of hit me that this is this is the real life. This is, you know, what you do in that building and how it actually transforms people's lives right around the nation. And, you know, that's amazing. So you've uh, you've written this book, Sex, Lies and Question Time, which I have. You have. Uh, <laughs> a bit of nod to the Steve Soderbergh of 1989 film, Sex, Lies and Videotapes, starring uh, Peter Gallagher, Sandy Cohen, arguably mm. the greatest TV dad of all time. Indeed. Um, and, you know, the book... The, the movie is, I should say. It's The book is not st starring Sandy Cohen. The book is actually starring Kate Ellis, uh, me, and the cast of 16 different women from across politics who I interviewed. But, you know, Sandy Cohen would have been a good addition too, I'm sure. I'm surprised that Sandy Cohen did not make it into the book, <laughs> but I'm sure you'll, you could try it on the, the follow-up. Um at the start of the book, you talk about how you're all, you were always reluctant to share your experiences uh, as a woman in politics. Um, why the change of heart? Why? What was the catalyst to put pen to paper and actually write a substantial book on this particular topic? I think just being out of the parliament was the catalyst um, for a couple of reasons. One is that, you know, I was asked on so many occasions when I was still a member of parliament to give a speech or write an article or, um, you know, addressing the topic, what what it's like to be a woman in, in Australia's parliament. And to be really frank with you, I just thought, that's not my job. My job isn't to talk about myself. My job isn't to talk about, you know, my colleagues. I'm not a commentator. I was there to do a job and that was represent my community or advocate for my portfolio. And so I always knew that that had to be my priority and that it would be a bit indulgent um, to do that when you're a member of parliament. But it wasn't until after I left um, that a couple of things happened. One, I was really genuinely surprised by how many people were really interested in what's it like in there. Is it, you know, is it terrible being a woman in the parliament? Um, so I saw that there was a genuine level of interest. But the other thing is, I guess I entered the normal world and it became really apparent that the culture in Parliament is a long way behind what I think the culture is in the rest of modern Australia. And that's a really big problem. If this is the place that is making all of the decisions affecting people's lives, then it should be leading and not falling behind. And I think it has fallen behind. And we've seen ample evidence of that um, since I wrote the book. There was me last year thinking I was being really controversial, saying maybe the culture of parliament isn't great for Australian women. And of course, by the time the book came out, all of Australia had already been well convinced of that fact. I, um, I'm going to stay away from asking you specific questions about contents within the book because I think people should buy the book and read it. Um, but the, t the toxic culture in Canberra that you talk about, I'm, I am interested for the audience to understand your experiences of it when you first went up there, um, yeah. you know, I'm sure you had a lot of aspirations and idealistic views about what you wanted to do. And then maybe you got hit in the wall by this toxic culture. Well, I guess what I saw was, um, so I interviewed women from across the political spectrum and every single one of them um, said that they'd been treated differently there than their male colleagues. Every single one had um, many examples of that and they differed um, from person to person. But with me, I think um, I experienced a lot of um, what we've seen in um, in big media events as slut shaming or sexual rumours that are used to undermine someone's credibility. And I experienced that 
like right from the beginning. I remember one of my first weeks in Parliament when I was out one night and a then Liberal staffer came up to me and said, Kate, the only thing anyone wants to know about you is just how many blokes you had to sleep with to get to Parliament. He, he put it um, in a cruder way than that. And I was a bit taken aback. I was like, this doesn't sound like a very friendly chat. But it was also the level of confidence and entitlement for an unelected young man to say that to an MP just, I think, was reflective of um, women face these different obstacles, whether it's people bringing them down, trying to undermine their credibility by suggesting that they're frivolous and that they're too busy, you know, worrying about their own sex lives um, to be serious and get on with the job. You know, other people had different experiences where um, um, it might be that people didn't listen to what they were saying or concentrate on what they're saying because there was just this fascination with what they looked like or how they dressed. Um, but all of these things, it became really clear as something that the women in the parliament experience and either the men don't or they don't anywhere near to the same degree. And there is no question that everybody had been treated differently based on gender in that building. And, you know, I was really torn. I think for me, the biggest challenge of the whole book was that I want um, things to change. And I think that what we've learned over the last little while is that they're not changing by themselves. Like you've actually got to call them out and shine a light on it if you want to change the behaviour. But at the same time, the other thing I really want is for more women to go into politics. So I had this struggle like all throughout the book with every chapter where I sat and I tried to get the balance right of um, wanting it to be better, but also not wanting to completely turn people off politics at all. Um, and that was, that was really hard. Um, it was really hard because... You know, ultimately, I want more women in the parliament, but I also want it to be better for them. Where have you ended up with that struggle? Um, well, I tried to, I tried to get the balance right, and I hope that I, I hope that I have. Like, I, this isn't a bitter book. This isn't, you know, someone whose career ended in a way that, you know, I'm um, unable to get past, and that I'm bitter about it, and so venting. I'm not bitter at all. Like I am so grateful for my, for my experience in the parliament, um, and I recognise that if you're interested in politics and you have the chance to sit in the parliament and make a difference, then that is the greatest opportunity, and people should take it up. Um, and so I've tried to also write the positives. I've tried to write about why it's the greatest job, why it's worth it all. Um, you know, Tanya Plibersek has some great quotes in the book, but one of them was she just said, like, really frankly, she said, Kate, I'd put up with 10 times the shit if I, if I had to because it's worth it. And the other thing that I wanted to shine a light on, which I don't know has been done as much as it should have, is that having women in the parliament has actually made a difference to this country. You know, there are a whole range of policies which were prioritised, advocated for, you know, funded... Um, in budgets because there was a woman there advocating for them and otherwise that would never have happened. Mm -hmm. And so I think telling the story of, you know, there may be some things that you are challenged by along the way, but the rewards for that um, are enormous. And I wanted to tell that side too. Did In, in your public leadership uh, with a public profile, you know, moments like the one you shared before about that young staffer coming up to you and yeah. saying those inappropriate things. Now, naturally, you'd expect in that scenario that there has to be behaviour change by that person. But I'm imagining that the behaviour change was actually was, was you. You had to readjust how you conducted yourself, which is, sounds ridiculous, mm. I know. Um, was that the case? And yeah. was that the case for the, the other uh, women politicians you spoke to in terms of their experiences? Yeah, one of the really interesting things is... I think women acknowledge that, um, you know, politics is like a lot of industries where the real power is in the networking, is in the information sharing, is in the building alliances. Um, and that happens outside of the parliament. That happens in the pubs, in the restaurants, in the cafes. And a, a number of women recognise that you take a risk. Um, if you go and are a part of that, then any male journalist, business leader, senior politician that you're seen with, there's a very good chance that rumours will be spread that 
um, you're just sleeping with them or you're just trying to get ahead um, in that way. But there's also a risk if you don't go. If you don't go, then you're not a part of that. You don't get that information. You don't build those networks. And so women have to make a call. And Sarah Hanson Young actually said that, you know, for a long time she avoided those situations because she'd been exposed to um, rumours about her and a journalist who um, she had caught up with socially. And then she realised you can't vacate the space. Um, you, you can't. That's, you're giving up too much. It's too great a sacrifice if you do that. Um, but different women have made different decisions about that. And, you know, I think there's a whole range of things where you have to decide, um, you know, in the way that you dress. Um, one woman put it, you can't look too pretty or attractive because then you're a bimbo. You can't look too old or frumpy or ugly because then, you know, you're deemed to be lazy or... Um, you know, not care about, um, not have self-esteem, whatever it might be. What you have to aim for is just to be me completely mediocre in the middle so nobody notices anything. And that's actually a lot of work to, to try and, you know, not go too far either way. And I think it's all of these things that women, not just in politics, but women in a whole lot of um, workplaces have to grapple with. Like, how do you just walk that fine line and not fall too far either way on a whole range of different issues. And it's, it's ridiculous that that's still happening today. I was intrigued by the, the politicians that you spoke to um, and the list that I want to know about the, the process, the thought process that went into who you're going to reach out to. Obviously, you spoke to people from your own caucus, from the, um, from the Conservatives, from the Greens, even Pauline Hanson. Yes. Um, talk us through the, the thinking of this. Um, well, partly it was curiosity on my part. It was curiosity, you know, is the other things that I'd experienced reflective of women's experiences more broadly? And in order to answer that question, I had to speak to people from a broader cross-section of the parliament. Um, but then there were some women who had really obvious um, examples or stories that I wanted to dig into. You know, we'd, we'd just a couple of years previously seen Sarah Hanson Young actually go to court um, in a defamation suit about the sexual um, insults that were being hurled at her in the parliament. And I wanted to talk to her about that. Um, obviously, Emma Hassar had also um, had a similar thing happen, although published, um, with false sexual rumours about her published. Um, I wanted to speak to this, the most senior women. So Julia Gillard and Julie Bishop are obviously the most senior women we've ever had from um, those major parties. And the Pauline Hanson one was, um, it, it was something I grappled with for a little bit because I, I was I was curious um you know, she'd had this amazing experience that I think a lot of us had forgotten about, where she literally woke up one day, went and picked up the Sunday newspaper, and there are pornographic pictures covering the front page of the newspaper, um, and with allegations that these are long lost pictures of her when she did an X-rated photo shoot as a 19 year old. And she's picking up the paper, and as it turns out, it's not her, and it never was her but it's splashed on the front pages. And then for the next week, breakfast TV, talkback radio, the whole country is debating whether it's her or not. Mm -hmm. Like that would never, ever happen to a male politician. Um, and so I thought it was interesting that um, that had kind of been left off the list of crimes that have been committed against female MPs. And I, I thought it'd be interesting to get her reflections on that and to speak to her about it. You know, it actually got to the point where during that week, she publicly said, look, I promise it's not me. I can even show you my belly button as proof um, because it's different to the one in this X-rated picture. Like, that's insane. Mm -hmm. So I thought um, I'd have a chat with Pauline and see what she had to say about that, um, which was a really quite bizarre and surreal experience for me as well because I'd never had a conversation with her. Um but I guess the answer to your question is um, I was interested to see different women, different age, different background, different parties, what are the different experiences? And there were some really big differences between minor parties and major parties as well. Um, so I, I thought that that was worthwhile. 
anything that in particular sort of jumped out at you or surprised you or shocked you or was it kind of a teachable moment even for your own from your own experiences oh yeah there were there were lots actually um but one of the things i thought was really interesting was that um women in minor parties talked about how they felt like they were set up to compete with other women even within their own parties that it seemed the smaller the group of women um you would think maybe the closer the relationships would be but actually it seems that from those that i spoke to it was the opposite that um you know they were kind of um rivals and there were kind of structures in place that encouraged a, a real rivalry amongst women um one of the things that was really interesting was when I sat down with Natasha Stott Despoia, who, you know, had um, gone through her journey a few years before me. But it was only when we sat down and were talking about different experiences. I, I had this moment where I thought that there is probably no one else in the world that could empath empathise more with some of my experiences than she could and vice versa. So that was actually really um, it was really eye-opening because at the time I, th I think I thought, oh, we're completely different. We've made different decisions. We're from different parties. We're in different houses. But actually a whole lot of the forces um, that she faced were exactly the same, maybe in different ways. So that was quite interesting. That, that, that's interesting you said that because I think at the time when you first got elected, there was the media were trying to draw a lot of comparisons between you and Natasha because she was the youngest woman to go into the senate you were the youngest yes. woman to go into the house of Represent representatives you're both in south australia um yes. i don't know and, if you wore, and, both wore doc martens but you know there was there was a lot of things that they were trying to pair you up with yeah and and i had the advantage of i got to learn a, a lot from that i mean i remember before my first day in parliament you know the fact that she wore, wore doc martens on the first day on her first day in parliament has something that has followed her forever and will follow her forever like it's insane but i remember so my first day in parliament and i thought well i'm not going to make that mistake i'm going to um you know try and stick to the middle of the road pick something not very noteworthy and so i did what like i imagine many 27 year old women would do in that case i went off to queue and bought myself what i thought was a nice fancy new suit um but it was like a grey pinstripe suit, like completely not noteworthy in any way. You know, black little singlet, sensible black shoes. And I, I, th I felt pretty good about myself. I thought, see, I'm, not, I'm avoiding that trap. I'm going off to Parliament. And actually what I found was the next day there were two newspaper articles. And I hadn't even spoken in the Parliament. You know, I hadn't made my first speech. But there were two newspaper articles published about my outfit that day. One saying that I look like I was dressed for a day out at the cricket. And the other one saying that um, Kate Ellis walked into the parliament in impossibly tight pants. And, you know, it was, it was rubbish, but it showed me from day one that, you know, this wasn't something about the decisions I made or the decisions that even Natasha had made. This was about, you know, trying to um, focus on women's physical appearance from day one before you've, even actually heard what they stand for or have to say or might achieve in the parliament. You talked about, and a lot of the um, women you spoke to talked about the, you know, we talked about the toxic culture in, in Canberra, but also the, 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 in, the adversarial environment of the parliament, mm -hmm. um, which I had, think I had Annika Wells on, I don't know when it was last year, maybe last year was a blur, maybe it was a year before, who knows? Anyway, we were talking about that. Um, and you know how parliament and i think you wrote you wrote about this you know question time it's, it's it's there's a lot of yelling loud noises that kind of stuff um where you know is that conducive to policy discussion is that conducive to you know reaching across the aisle and finding common ground and coalition for the you know the shared purpose of what we're trying to do is it to make australia a better place is there is there a is there has there been a moment or will there be a moment in which women will look across the aisle and kind of roll their eyes and go, look at these dickheads and actually kind of use your collective strength and power and the commonalities that are articulated in your book uh, and try to create change. Is that, I mean, are we being um, aspirational? I don't know or? whether it can just fall on women to create that change. I do think that our question time doesn't serve us well. I mean, I think if you look at even the systems that our parliament is based on, you know, 
um, the UK, their question time doesn't operate like ours, where it's, you know, pot shots on the issue of the day, trying to line up and have a crack at the opposition. You know, theirs is actually based on the portfolio of the day and what's happening and policy questions. Um, so I, I don't know what we, I hope that we will see that change and that women will play a role in that. But, you know, the difficult thing was that there are a lot of people who I think would have liked it if I could tell them that women were going to join together, we're going to save the parliament, we're going to bring about change, when actually from what I've witnessed is the structures of the parliament have been used to turn women against women. And what I, what I mean by that is that like when Julia Gillard was prime minister, it wasn't Tony Abbott who was asking the most personal questions about her life and her boyfriend from 20 years previously. Um, he wasn't standing up and asking those questions. And I assume that's because he didn't want to look like he was bullying a woman. So what does he do or what do they do? They get the women on their side um, to do it instead. And I'm not just blaming this on Tony Abbott because it, it is a pattern that has continued ever since. If you have a female minister who is in strife, who is on the ropes, it'll more than likely be a female from the opposition who will be asking the really hard questions. And what's happened is, um, so rather than women changing the structure and the tone of question time, they've kind of been sucked in to do the bloke's dirty work when it comes to other women instead. And I think that's something that we need to have a greater awareness of. And I think that, um, you know, people need to push back on that. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's interesting you said that, like it, it, we can't just leave it up to women, but I'm kind of thinking about like, you know, you wrote about how the affirmative action changes into the Labor Party rules really were pushed by people like Joan Kerner. Now, yes, in the end, yeah. men have to, you know, see ground or whatever, but I, I just don't think that male politicians are going to make change out of the goodness of their heart. I, I think that that's true on some issues. I just think on the issue of question time, you know, we've actually had some discussion on um, ref possible reforms to question time, how you could improve it. And unfortunately, it's one of those things that I think every opposition says this question time um, isn't working, you know, we need to do better for the people of Australia. And then they get into government and realise that actually question time works pretty well for government, you get to beat up the opposition every day, you get to set the agenda. Um, and so nothing much changes. But we have seen um, male politicians have played a key role. And I'd have to check this, but I, I'm pretty sure it's Milton Dick who's been doing some work in this regard in this parliament um, and the inquiries in that as well. So I'd love to see question time reform. I just, I don't think it serves any purpose. Um, it doesn't serve the purpose it's meant to around accountability of government um, because governments don't have to answer questions. But what it does do is it creates this really vicious tone um, in the parliament. And what it does do is turn people off Australian politics. Um, you know, I, I, think it's, I think it's terrible and unhelpful and actually destructive the way that our question time is currently, um, currently runs. When you were um, writing the book, did you consider um, widening the, the, the scope of the book to talk about the experiences of political staff as well you were once a staff yourself in the south australian state labor government um why just keep it focused on um i guess that like my biggest regret was after i'd finished the book and i finished the book at the end of last year so it was still a couple of months before Brittany higgins came out um before we had a focus on um what was happening and you know, so many people, it was a couple of weeks before my book was due to be released. And so many people were saying to me, oh, what perfect timing, Kate, like, mm. how good is this for your book? And I just felt this incredible weight anytime anyone said that, because I felt a guilt that um, I don't, I know that I hadn't seen how bad things were and how dangerous things were for the most vulnerable women in that building, um, that being the staff. And I, I felt a real guilt that I hadn't focused on that more. I mean, I think what we what we see in the parliament is there is this there is this culture of just a general disrespect for women, and that plays out with the most senior women in the building. 
But of course, like anywhere in society where that's most acute and most dangerous is with the least powerful women there. And, you know, if I was writing the book today, it would be a very different book. But I really just thought I was writing a book about what I knew about. Um, and I certainly hope that things have changed a lot since the 20 odd years ago when I was a staff member. But, you know, evidence would suggest they haven't changed anywhere near enough. I'm keen to get your thoughts on the... the the Brittany Higgins experience, um, mm. given that you obviously had, as you just mentioned before, just finished writing the book mm. uh, and then this happens. I, I think it maybe it was last year or the year before I was talking to a group of um, Labor Party friends, uh, women, and I, I was pos posing the question, I was saying, in the United States, th th they had a, you know, a very strong Me Too movement and, and, and I think it still continues to this day, but there was like an apex there where a lot of men in various uh, industries, m media, politics, um, um, business, were being held to account. Uh, Hollywood mm -hmm. were being held to account. Um, people were losing their jobs. You know, like Al Franken resigned as a senator. Um, it was, the list is long and endless. And I s we were talking and I said, I, I just, at, at this time I was going, I don't think Australia's had that. And I thought it was going to happen. I remember there was a journalist who apparently had a list of people and I don't know, nothing materialised about that. I just assumed that eventually it would be, you know, like that wave would come across to Australia and it didn't happen. Well, I don't think it happened anyway. And then we've had this year. And this time mm -hmm. I felt like, okay, now there's a level, there is, well, one would argue if there is any accountability, people ha heads haven't rolled yet, but it seems like it's starting to happen. Is this the genesis of the Me Too movement happening here in Australia? But And will it go beyond just politics in Canberra? Um, I, I think there's n no doubt that there is a momentum and I think it will go beyond Canberra. Um, I think what's actually happened is that you know, when you look at the statistics of how many women have been sexually assaulted in Australia, you know, we, we um, toss around the statistic one in five women over the age of 15. But when you actually dig into that, what that means is that right now there were well over a million women in Australia who have been sexually assaulted in their life and most of them have never reported it and many of them have never told anyone, have thought there's nothing I can do about this. I'm just going to shut up and try and get on with my life. And something really powerful has happened in the last few months. I think, um, you know, Grace Tame standing up as the Australian of the year and frankly talking about the abuse that she endured, but also saying to people, the only way through this is to stand up and speak your truth. We have to shine a light on it. Um, I think made a lot of those million people who have their own truths stop and reflect on what happened in their own life as well. And I think then that when Brittany Higgins stood up, um, you know, so bravely and told her story and people saw, I think up until then there'd been this view that, you know, the par this happened to women in Australia, but the parliament and the judicial system were trying to find ways to make it better. And when people saw that it happened, not just in Parliament House, but in a ministerial office in Parliament House, and, you know, it made them think, well, if it's happening there, what's going to stop it from happening here in my neighbourhood? And I think that the, I think the government um, and the Prime Minister in particular so seriously mismanaged um, and just missed the moment and didn't read the mood um, that I think people have become quite disillusioned with um, the whether politicians actually really understand what's happening to women in our communities and whether they actually care. And, you know, that's been devastating for a lot of women. And but what has happened is women have been disclosing to each other, to their husbands, to their families, to their friends, like this is all coming out of the open. And that's why I think the momentum will continue. And um, I've got to tell you, <clears throat> when I was being interviewed pre and post the release of the book, um, I was genuinely surprised by how many of the female journalists who interviewed me um, said to me afterwards, oh, the media's got to be next, or some of the things I've seen, or the stories I could tell. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't be surprised at all if we see this sweep through other sectors. Um, but the thing we need to be focused on, I think, is that this has been really painful. All this coming up has been really painful. A lot of people have been reliving one of the worst things that ever happened to them. And 
it's not enough for us to just have a focus on it. It's not enough for people to just come out and tell their stories. We, we actually have to use this moment to bring about real change. Um, and I'm going to ask you about that in a moment, but just the, I just want to pick up on that point about the media because I think mm. that the, certainly in Canberra, I think they're a part of that problem. Yeah, um, I do too. And I, you know, I see sort of courage in the reporting of Sam Maiden and Louise Milligan um, and I'm sure there's a whole heap of other w uh, women journalists around the country to writing this stuff and probably getting, maybe getting, who knows what's going on in the editorial rooms in terms of them trying to get these stories out. But... You know, you mentioned before about how the federal government have really handled this badly. I kind of watch the way that some male journalists are handling this as well. Um, and I look, hey, I'm no expert on this sort of stuff. I, I'm trying to keep my mouth shut and just listen to to women around me about this issue because I have no lived experience about this. I, you know, but I've watched some journal. Even even an idiot from country Victoria has watched some journalists on the ABC, male journalists, t you know, interview. Um, maybe women politicians or fellow women journalists and just really fuck it up. And I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, dude, shut up. Just stop talking now because you're making a complete ass of yourself. And the eye rolls in some of those um, uh, press briefings from journal male journalists behind a, a Sam Maiden or someone who's asking a, question, a pointed question and a good question to the Prime Minister. And I just feel like there must be some serious divisions going on within this fraternity mm -hmm where change also has to happen because these are the people who are reporting this sort of stuff. They hold, yeah. you, you know, former politicians, they hold politicians accountable. So they've got a responsibility here and I think they're letting us down as well. Yeah, I, I think there's two reasons for that. I think there's one category of blokes that just don't get it. As you said, they have no lived experience of it and they just don't get it, but they're used to being experts on everything and having an opinion on everything. So have been talking up. And I thought that particularly before all of, you know, the really big um, allegations came forward when there was the first Four Corners story and it talked about um, a couple of ministers and their relationships with um, female staff members at the time. And there were obviously huge power imbalances and consequences for those women when the relationships ended. But it was really interesting that there were some really senior male journos who were saying, why is this a story? How is this in the public interest? And just didn't get that other side of it at all. Um, but the other thing that I think has happened is that there are some male journalists who would love um, to believe, and maybe they do believe, that this is all about politics. It's about those left-wing um, women activists and organisations trying to damage a conservative government. And so they're trying to bring it into the frame of the culture wars, um, that it's just, you know, um, some woke ideology that um, or something. Um, and, you know, that's really damaging. You know, if we need to do one thing, we just need people to realise that this is real. And, you know, those statistics are staggering. Like, I can't get my head around that. And I just wish that some of those men would have a think about those statistics when they're writing about how th this is all just politics. Because I actually have a view which is probably not that popular, but I don't think this is about party politics at all. And I don't even know whether this is going to harm Scott Morrison and the government as much as people think it, it will. I actually think that something even more destructive is happening, and that is women are losing faith in the parliament as a whole. Mm. I think that it's being reflected upon the parliament as a whole and feeling really let down and disappointed by the parliament as a whole. So, I mean, I may be wrong. Obviously, there were some um, pretty stark um, polling figures on the gender divide, particularly post Brittany Higgins and the Christian Porter allegations. Um, but I, I suspect that they just think that nobody gets it in that place. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, solutions. I had uh, Liberty Sanger from Morris Blackburn. Uh, I love Liberty. Julia Fox, the National Assistant Secretary of the SDA and Natalie Hutchins, uh, State um, Labor Party um, MP in Victoria on the show for International Women's Day. Hmm. Um, and they were, um, they were trying to tackle all of the problems in an hour uh, and did a great job of it. But they were talking about, in particular, reporting inappropriate behaviour at work. Um, and I want to get a sense from you about what you think the solutions are in terms of how do we deal with this um, in the workplace, um, making, um, you know, reporting more accessible, people, work, um, uh, um, managers and, and employers more accountable. 
and how do we support victims and giving people the ability to report? Where, where, where do we go here? Do you mean in the parliament or more broadly? Well, hell, let's just start with the parliament maybe. Look, I think in the parliament it's got to be about calling this stuff out. You know, I, I've been really heartened by how many men in the parliament from different political parties rang me after the book was released and said, I didn't realise that was going on or thanked me for increasing their awareness. Or I had one just the other day who said, um, I've actually been, been, been seeing some of the blokes on his side um, making fun of a woman's physical appearance every time she contributes. And he's felt really uncomfortable about it. But having read the book, he's going to call it out now. He's actually going to say to them, that's not on. Yeah. So I think um, shining a light on things in the parliament is really important. And I think um, not just electing more women, but electing better men as well. We've already seen a change in the culture in the Labor Party. Um, I think since we've had more women and had a new generation of men start coming through as well. Um, I think that the bigger question on what do we do in the community, you know, I think people would really like it if we could say, if you just funded this one thing over here, all of this would stop. And um, all of the evidence says, you know, it's about bringing up people better to not disrespect women, which means it's got to be in primary prevention campaigns and it's got to be in real education campaigns that don't involve milkshakes and don't involve euphemisms. It's got to be... You know, if you want to stop our domestic violence levels, our levels of sexual assault, our levels of sexual harassment, it all comes back to this um, disrespect for women that exists in our community to a level that it shouldn't. And that's what you've got to change. In the short term, though, oh, I've got quite a list, haven't I? Um, in the short term, you know, when we're a country where one woman is being killed every year, I don't understand how we can have women's support services and shelters saying that they don't have the resources that they need to meet that demand. Like that is just, um, I just can't understand how anyone could tolerate that with the kind of stories we've seen. So one thing you could do tomorrow is actually properly fund women's support services and shelters. And um, they should, everybody should, states um, and the federal government should put more in um, there, there are stories constantly about services turning women away or not being able to cater for the number of women um, who want to access that service. And, you know, if women don't have a safe place to sleep or um, the support they need to know where to turn, well, that's a pretty dangerous situation and we should address it tomorrow. Or even today. The... Or yesterday. Indeed. Uh, Sex, Lies and Question Time by Kate Ellis. Um, where can you, how can you get the book? Well, wow. all good bookshops um, uh, stocking the book. The audio book is out now um, and you can also look online. Um, the book is everywhere, although I did see it's not in the, um, in the bookshops in the airport, which I was really disappointed about because that's where I used to buy a lot of my books. But all the other good ones have got it and um, yeah, give it a read. Let me know what you think. Did you have to do the audio for the audio book? Well, um, no, I was going to do the audio for the audio book, um, but they didn't have studios in Adelaide. And because of the COVID situation, um, I didn't want to travel. Um, which everyone has said, um, I kind of dodged a bullet because you basically have to sit in a room for four or five days just listening to the sound of your own voice. Um, so no, someone else has has, uh, has recorded the audio book, which I've, I've only listened to about 30 seconds of it, but I just found so strange. It's so strange hearing your stories of your life being told in someone else's um voice and speech patterns um so it's quite bizarre so no it's not me but it's available and she's got a lovely voice so <laughs> give it a whirl i don't know if this is true but someone told me uh former speaker of the house of representatives uh uh leader in the house um uh, john boner is it ba uh, john is it his first name boner you know it, it look if you read it out loud it looks like boner but he's called boner right. his book he read the audio he recorded the audio for his book but he doesn't apparently he did it over a couple of bottles of wine and every now and then he goes off script and he ad libs. Oh, that's great. I would have loved to have done that. And he just gets stuck into people. So there's bits yeah. that aren't even in the book. So if you were to read along whilst he talks, 
all of a sudden there's stuff on the pages that he's saying that isn't there. I reckon that's great. Yeah. Well, maybe it would just be the never-ending book if you did it like that. Yeah. You know? I don't know if this is true, but I think this is a fantastic idea and um, I'm all about it. One more question before you go um, because the last time I spoke to you was in 2017 and since then your beloved Glenelg Football Club finally won um, a South Australian national national uh, football league premiership in 2009 against Port Adelaide. Oh, and it gets even better Go on on. my birthday. Wow. There you go. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know that. I assume the whole family went down to the Adelaide Oval for that moment. We did indeed. Um, I then dropped the kid. So I think I had a one year old and a three year old or something at the time who, of course I decked out in all their tigers gear and then dropped them back home after the game and took my mother down to the Glenelg Footy Club rooms to celebrate with the thousands of people who were gathered there. And just because I'm sure that many of your listeners are very interested in the progress of the Glenelg Football Club, I can also tell you that we are currently undefeated and sitting top of the ladder. So, um, yeah, things are pretty exciting in local South Australian football. (laughs) These are the return of the glory years for the Bays, is that what you're saying? I can only hope so. It it was a it was a long time in it was, between. It was. You'll have to update all your passwords. Um, <laughs> Don't say that. Uh, well, you I'm going to broadcast that. I haven't, people are going to get into every one of my accounts. I haven't com- completely given it up, completely away. There are a number of premierships you could choose from. Okay. Th- Kate, Stop it. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Lovely to see you again. Please go out and buy her book, Sex, Lies and Question Time. It's an excellent read. Um, and uh, we look forward to the sequel. Uh, Don't hold your breath, but thank you very much for having me.